I'd like to start by thanking Robert Kagan for coming today to speak and be the inaugural speaker for the University of Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism lecture series uh, that will be starting off with your talk tonight about America as the indispensable country, nation in the world. You are one of the foremost voices in Washington and have been for years uh, calling for America to act and continue to act as the indispensable country in the world to maintain and spread the liberal international order. Why do you believe that? It's led to you know, overwhelmingly positive economic growth over many decades. It's spread democracy, which I happen to think is a good thing. And since World War II, it's also kept the peace among the great powers. So uh, I think the order is something that is both unprecedented in history. We've really never had a time like this for all the terrible things that are still going on in the world. Uh, by comparison, it's really unique. Um, and I also think that it's very fragile. Uh, it doesn't have to last. It's not a product of nature or progress or fate. Um, and that in fact, it is very much based on and sustained by American power beginning uh, after World War II uh, and continuing till today. And I really think that in the absence of American power, we would get a different kind of order, uh, an order that reflected the preferences of other powers perhaps, or we might get disorder, which has also historically been the product of a breakdown of order. So I think it's very valuable. It's easier, to, it's easier and less costly to maintain than it would be to try to rebuild if it collapsed. And I think that on balance, America benefits extraordinarily, extraordinarily from it. Uh, in 1989, the Cold War effectively came to an end when the Berlin Wall came down. And we had a new world where the United States suddenly was the world's sole superpower. Well, over those last now 25 years, how do you see American foreign policy and how closely has it resembled what you believe should be America's foreign policy? Well, I think all things being equal, it's been on the trajectory which it began on in World War II. I think one of the striking things is the degree to, of continuity of, of American foreign policy um, even after the end of the Cold War. Of course, mm -hmm. a lot of people think that American foreign policy was built in response to the Soviet Union, but that's not true. It was actually built in response to the events of the 1930s and a desire to make sure that those things never happened again, the breakdown of the economic order, the breakdown of the security order. Um, and so it didn't actually depend on the Soviet Union. But I think a lot of people expected mm -hmm. that thinking that it was all about the Soviet Union and, and international communism, that when those things fell away, then the United States would, would move into a different kind of phase. Mm. But very early on, I would say beginning with the George H.W. Bush administration, mm. there was a major reassertion of, that, um, of this approach. Mm. Uh, the New World Order, as uh, Bush called it, was really part of that old uh, dream. And I would say the first Iraq war, mm. if you look at the rationale that Brent Scowcroft uh, gives for it in their combined memoirs, it was really about preserving this world order and, the, and, and particularly the, Amer the American role in preserving it. And I think if you go through uh, Bush 1, Clinton, uh, Bush 2, um, and even in some respects today with, with Obama, although there's certain elements obviously from which he dissents, mm. uh, we've seen that kind of continuity. But you know, how long the American people want to do this is of course the big question and it's mm. quite a burden. Mm. It's a very difficult role to play and I think we certainly have seen since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan a kind of weariness with this role. And I think that's going to be one of the great questions of the 2016 election is mm. what do the American people want? So if we um, look back to the 1930s, we clearly see disasters happening in Europe right and left. And then World War II, another major disaster coming out of the 1930s. So there's no doubt it would be desirable to transform Europe and possibly more uh, into a liberal order. And then also America had nearly 50% of the world's GNP. So we had an inordinate amount of wealth and power with which to fashion that European order. Order, which arguably then uh, went fairly well as a project. Um, however, now as we see America's power shrinking in the world, um, the latest st uh, statistics from the IMF uh, show that as a share of world product, the United States is now 16% almost neck and neck with China on a PPP basis. Um, and this is a very different world. 
if we changed, had other measures, we would still see America's share of world power is much smaller than it was in the 50s and the 60s and even in the early, compared to the early 90s. Do we have the power to truly spread the world order or are we gonna be lucky to just hold on to what we've got? I guess I don't, I don't really agree that uh, in, terms, in relative terms that our power has actually declined all that much. And it's very easy, uh, I'm not, you're not doing this, but it's very easy to have a very rosy view of how brilliantly successful we were in the early part of the mm -hmm. Cold War. In fact, mm -hmm. we suffered immense setbacks in that first decade when we had 50% of GDP. And of course, that was an accident of history. Uh, the major other, other major economic powers were on their back. Uh, we dropped from 50% to around 25% by around the 1960s, simply because of the return of Germany and Japan uh, as major economies in the world. I didn't consider that, I don't consider that movement from 50 to 25 a net loss for the United States because we had these two very strong allies. Um, and as far as the shrinking share of American GDP, uh, global GDP, I mean, I just don't know how significant that is. China's GDP is, uh, is very big. Its per capita GDP is very small. Um, mm. I think it's something like $4,000 a person compared to $40,000 a person in the United States. Uh, China faces immense strategic difficulties uh, surrounded by great powers that fear it to some extent. I think the United States still enjoys an enormous advantage. Uh, it is generally welcomed in the two major regions where it has been a, a key player, which is Europe uh, and, uh, and Asia. Mm. Uh, it's, it has allies all around the world, over 50 allies and partners compared to China, which has like two. Mm -hmm. um, America enjoys enormous capacities and of course, um, all those IMF figures may not prove to be good predictions as we move forward, depending on the direction of the American economy and the direction of other economies. Obviously, the Chinese economy has slowed down. The American economy right now is the envy of the world. There's the energy revolution. Um, so I'm not as quick, I guess, to say that we've lost the capacity. I think that the, the, the basic fundamental uh, uh, capacities and advantages that the United States has enjoyed uh, are still there and mm -hmm. that other people, other powers have many more disadvantages. I wouldn't trade places with Russia or, or China. So I think it's still a capacity, we have the capacity, it's really, it's a really a question of will mm -hmm. at this point. And um, I would also say, you know, strategically we're far better off today than we were in say n the mid-1970s. Um, I don't wish we had Soviet Union and 300,000 troops in the heart of Europe again. I mean, we're in really much better shape than that. So I'm, I'm more optimistic, but again, uh, it is a fragile world. It does depend on, on, on American activism, which the American people may or may not be interested in, in doing. And of course, you brought up the 30s, and of course, in the 20s and 30s, that was a role the American people were not interested in playing. Yeah. So let me ask about the nature of America's role. You sometimes talk about the United States having to impose uh, international liberal orders. To what extent is this fundamentally a unilateral project? Uh, do we have to mainly rely on ourselves as Americans to maintain that order? Well, first of all, when I say that, um, what I mean to say is all orders are imposed. Nothing occurs by nature. Historically, great powers have created an order off usually in their image. There was an Egyptian world order, there was a Greek world order, there was a European world order for several centuries, and this present order has been shaped uh, very much in conformity with American preferences. So somebody's gonna be imposing some kind of order. And, and when I say impose, it's a kind of brutal point, but you know, what I'm really responding to is this notion that there is some that there could ever be an order that everyone has agreed to. Um, you're never going to have uh, the Russian leadership agree that this is the best of all possible worlds. There's always going to be international competition um, and, and it's impossible to have a democratic world system and I would say it's impossible to have a just world system. Mm. So the only question is what kind of imposition is it going to be? Mm. And I would prefer this particular imposition which by the way as impositions go, it's a pretty, it's a pretty light kind of imposition. I mean, uh, I don't think Europeans feel imposed on. I don't think most Asians feel imposed on. It's the it's those who who are not happy with the order, 
mm. who feel imposed on, and, and I, I understand why they do, mm. but somebody's going to be imposed on. So in 2003, you wrote a book, New York Times bestseller, that was famous for talking about the differences between Americans and Europeans. Europeans were essentially uh, softies uh, from Venus. Americans were kind of tough uh, from Mars. Um, and one of the ways that you thought about that was in terms of the amount of um, spending uh, that the Europeans were willing to put into defense compared to Americans. Well, now we're starting to see American defense spending as a share of our GNP starting to decline and certainly be limited. Um, and as we look forward out, say, 20, 30 years, we're seeing the um, retirement of baby boomers uh, that are going to increasingly eat up uh, the health care costs, the retirement costs, more and more GNP. As we look over the next 20 years, are we going to start to see the convergence of the American and European approaches, or do you see the real possibility where we can maintain the kind of muscular foreign policy you think is so important? Uh, I do think that, that we are not only going to, but we are in the process of changing it right now. I mean, mm -hmm. you have the President Obama, who is no, you know, he's not. George W. Bush or Harry Truman, for that matter, who are calling for an increase in the American defense budget. And I think that, you know, when I, I would anticipate over the next few years, we'll probably move back up over 3% mm. uh, of GDP, which is, uh, which is what it was during the Clinton years when the United States had a very robust foreign policy. Um, and unfortunately, Europeans really are hovering more around 1%, and, it's, mm. and there's a big difference. Now, I do want to say something about Europe uh, because it, it's not just a simple matter of them being... Uh, softies. I don't call them softies in the book. They, they, Europe had a special experience in the 20th century, which Americans did not have. They had the experience of two catastrophic world wars. Mm. Uh, they were, to say the least, victimized by those wars, and um, they have done everything they can to create a European situation which could never let that happen again. Uh, it's anti-nationalist. Uh, it's anti-power in many respects. Um, and Europeans would like to, and, and nothing could be more normal. For Americans, uh, we call the Second World War uh, our, our greatest generation. It was the good war. You know, we have a positive memory, actually, of World War II. Europeans do not. And um, there's, they've had a very different history. And so it's entirely understandable uh, that they have a different view of power in the world. Um, I think by and large we are, you know, always going to disagree to some extent. You can see it right now on the Ukraine issue. I mean, uh, the Obama administration is seriously thinking about providing uh, some form of lethal weapons to the Ukrainians and the Europeans are resistant to that. Mm -hmm. it's, two, it's two different worldviews. I don't think that means that we can't work in harmony though, uh, as we have been in general on the Ukraine issue. So I want to talk about whether our policies would be good for our allies in the short and medium term. One of the consequences of spreading democracy um, is nationalism. And we have lots of research that shows that in the first 10, 20 years of a transition to a democracy, this is a very violent period. And nationalism tends to be evoked. And if we look at um, uh, the U.S. going into Iraq in 2003 to create a democracy, I think there's no doubt that Iraq today is more democratic, but it's also more nationalist. And that nationalism has also spread over into uh, fueling nationalism in Syria and other parts of the Persian Gulf, um, making, some would say, Israel's security worse. So as we have a project to uh, spread the liberal order, which may be good for America, and we of course have our oceans to protect us from the blowback of nationalism, don't we run the risk of harming our allies in the short term? I disagree with almost every single premise of that statement. So, <laughs> well, I'm glad we I'm glad we could see almost die die. <laughs> um, uh, uh, beginning with, I I find I've looked at those studies and I'm very dubious about some mm. of the judgments that are made. When when Wilhelmine Germany is regarded as a democracy, um, I I begin I I begin to wonder what we're talking about. It, from a, from a military point of view, it was anything but a democracy. Mm. Uh, when when Milosevic's Serbia is regarded as a democratizing country, I really do. So I think that there's some real flaws in those studies. 
Um, nationalism is not a product of democracy. Nationalism is a product of humanity. Mm. And uh, you can get nationalism in many forms. Uh, and in fact, those, it's usually autocrats historically who've most attempted to exploit nationalism and led, and led it into uh, you know, violent activity both at home and abroad. That's the first point. The second point is, I just have to say, uh, whatever the value or merits or lack thereof of, of the invasion of Iraq, it was not done to promote democracy. Um, it was done for reasons that you know, then later proved to be mistaken, but democracy was an ex post facto justification. It was not the original motive. Uh, which gets to the point that I'm not in favor of running around imposing democracy everywhere. Um, uh, I do think that uh, most often the role the United States plays is as a kind of uh, when things reach a tipping point, which way do we tip? So for instance, in Egypt, uh, when Mubarak was, had clearly lost the support of his people, uh, and there were people in the streets. Uh, the United States had a decision to make. It could either stick with Mubarak or it could let him go after all these years of supporting him and they let him go and that's how come you had a, a revolution in Egypt. And then unfortunately, when we had a democratic election and the Muslim Brotherhood was elected, which I thought was a positive development, uh, everybody freaked out and now we're back to supporting a dictatorship again. Mm. I wish I could say mm. that America had been in the business of doing nothing but promoting democracy, but the, the history is littered with the dictatorships that the United States has also uh, promoted. So I don't think, you know, this whole idea that we're running around, you know, uh, toppling everybody to promote democracy mm. is not true. What has been true is that the number of democracies has spread enormously during the period of American sort of preeminence. Um, I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I think you can find all kinds of troubles in any kind of government, but we on balance are likely to see less of that in democracies uh, than we are in autocracies. So as we look forward to 2016, putting aside exactly which party will win and who you would support, let's just put that aside and just whoever wins, what policy in the near term, that is from 2016 to 2018, do you most wish the new president, whoever he or she is, would invoke? Right now, the two most important issues that we face, and I know that you're an expert on terrorism, so forgive me for saying this, okay. are over the, over, you know, in, in the terms of what effect they will have on the world order are China and Russia. Uh, they're the two uh, major powers that are, are unhappy with the international order as it's been constructed for many decades. Um, in the case of China, they are sort of biding their time and being a little bit more cautious. In the case of Russia, almost traditionally, they are being uh, more aggressive. And I think that meeting those two mm. challenges, um, and it's an unexpected challenge in Europe, of course, because we thought Europe was sort of taken care of and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, but I actually believe that uh, Putin's ambitions extend beyond Ukraine. Mm. Uh, they certainly extend mm. beyond Eastern Ukraine. Mm. Um, if, if we're talking about Russia's traditional sphere of influence, it stretches a lot farther uh, beyond Ukraine. And I think we actually have to be in the business of saying, no, the spheres of influence thing is over. Mm. Mm. I actually think that uh, is important because if we do move back to a spheres of interest world, we will move back to the wars that that world also creates. So. Mm. Being strong in East Asia, being a reliable ally, and there are a lot of allies in East Asia who wonder about our uh, reliability, uh, being a, a similarly, especially with the Eastern European countries, um, having uh, sufficient military capacity to deal with both of those problems, mm -hmm. um, I think that is the number one thing. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, if I knew what we should be doing in the Middle East, I would be writing it up yeah. and, and winning a, have some kind of prize. But I don't know exactly what the answer is in the Middle East. But I also feel like, you know, whoever wins is going to be grappling with that problem one way or another. So you've met with presidents. And um, as you think about the several presidents, um, and you don't necessarily have to, to name names, but as presidents go, um, what, what are the things that you find or do you find that uh, you think you most want to enlighten a president about? <laughs> I always seem to want to be enlightening about the same thing and uh, <laughs> I, I think I'm mostly failing. Um, 
No, I, uh, I just, I, you know, you know what I'm selling, and I, I, I want them to have a sense of the importance of the American role in the world and yeah. the need to talk to the American people about it. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I'm always, I always encourage them, you know, whatever, whatever policy you are carrying out, talk to the American people, sell them on it, because yes. there is a tendency, especially in this age of. People don't want to think, you know, it's the economy stupid or whatever right. the saying is. Right. You'll do the foreign policy, right. but you don't really want to have to sell it because you're not sure how the people are going to respond to it. And I, I just think that's a mistake. I think you've got to uh, sell it. In my own historical work, one of the things I really have been most impressed by is, and this is not a novel observation, is, is Franklin Roosevelt's mm. gradual mm. attempt, in his view, to mm. educate the American people, let them know what was going on. While his policies mm. were doing nothing, I mean, he wasn't doing anything. At the first sight of hostile opinion mm. to any policy, he would immediately back off. Mm. But he continued in, you know, fireside chats or press conferences or speeches to sort of say, this is what's going on in the world. During a campaign that I've now been part of, the, of I would say, distantly part of two campaigns, which convinced me I never want to be part of a campaign again. <laughs> It's very clear that the minute you let any political advisor mm. get anywhere near mm. a president, the first thing they're going to do is say, don't talk about foreign policy. Mm. And, mm. you know, to some extent that persists after a president's elected too. Yeah. And, um, and that's where I feel like, uh, you know, I get it, but you have now risen to a higher mission. And one of your missions is to talk to the American people about what the world looks like. Yeah. But one of the things I've often talked about is uh, – uh, the failure to explain uh, things would have been worse without the Libyan intervention. Mm -hmm. So all the problems we have, mm -hmm. but the biggest uh, uh, issue is every single one of those would have been worse without the intervention. Yeah. And the people who are not talking about that are in the Oval, uh, the White House. Yeah, uh, it's really just quite striking right, uh, what right, you're saying. Right. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. But, uh, well, maybe, uh, it's going to be interesting because, of course, I would say the conventional wisdom for several elections has been foreign policy is not even going to be part of the campaign. Mm. Uh, mm. That does not seem to be the case for 2016. Yeah. Foreign policy yeah. is going to be part of the campaign, probably in a very dumb way, mm. but it is going to be part of the campaign. So it'll be interesting to see whether uh, we get any enlightenment out of it. There are um, intellectuals like George Will that started out in the academy, Fried Zakaria started out in the academy, um, and then essentially became um, uh, media icons, yeah. um, and therefore necessarily had to treat many issues in a very thin way. Yeah. And that became, in fact, the weight of their work. Yeah. And some people would say, well, that's just Washington for you or New York for you. Mm -hmm. But you actually have been in Washington going in a somewhat different direction, who has become deeper over time, getting writing more deeply, getting a PhD over time, um, is that uh, it does seem like it's the rare, uh, you know, the road less taken. And is it the road less taken? And then um, should it be still taken? And if so, how important is that road today? Yeah. Um, the one thing I swore when I got graduated from college was I was never going to go back and get a PhD. <laughs> so uh, that was that's a failure. Uh, well, I swore I'd never be an academic. <laughs> well, there you <laughs> go. Um, but uh, no, I think that uh, you know if you're if, well, my father spent 20 years writing a four-volume history yeah. of the Peloponnesian War, yeah. and so that's the time frame that I think in. I'm, I'm spending now 20 years, it's, I'm, you know, it's going to be 20 years writing a history of American foreign policy. Mm. And um, I, you know, I don't know, I've had the luxury to be able to do this. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, I have a comfortable home at a think tank, which allows me to, to, to engage in this kind of work. But I'm, I'm, at this point, I've become almost a kind of violently anti-cyclical person. I mm. really feel like you know that that the the culture is really being, and I sound like an old. I'm increasingly an old fogey, so this is what old fogies say. But I mean, I feel like the culture is increasingly being destroyed by the technology, uh, and that um, yeah. and that the internet and the the need for you know people don't aspire to write twelve thousand word essays anymore. They aspire to be heard twelve thousand times. Yeah. And right. Um, right. so I have a first of all, it's not what I want to do. Uh, second, for me, the whole writing thing, it's all been about teaching myself, really. It's a lot mm. of, it's me, it's my sort of continuing mm. graduate school. Mm. And, but I also actually feel that the more extended work, the work that has a little bit more depth, a little bit more research, of something that you had to disappear for a year mm. and nobody saw you for a year to mm. produce, 
can actually have more influence mm. than some of the sort of, you know, the daily... Uh, well, my work on suicide terrorism, it took me two years to do it, and I right. then waited to yeah. come out with it oh, yeah. because I wanted to get things right, so to speak. Well, right, uh, and, look how really worth, and look how influential it was. It was and, worth, yeah. you know, I've had this very strange experience of writing a piece for the New Republic, the old New Republic, which is no longer with us, uh, a 12,000-word mm. piece on American foreign policy, which... Mm. But then it, it actually gets, you know, these things can get a fair amount of attention. One of the other changes that's happened in my lifetime is um, that Washington has become now a very permanent place. Mm -hmm. So in the 80s, yeah. much like when you, know, you and I are roughly the same age, yeah. uh, Washington was very transitional. Right. A lot of dynamics, people coming in and going out almost with every administration. Right. Uh, in um, the late uh, 90s, I interviewed Strobe Talbot once. Um, this was after he had uh, been involved with the Milosevic negotiations. It was about Kosovo and so forth. And I was, it, it struck me then because it was in his home. And he wasn't selling this home. I mean, right, this was right. this was going to be the home, right? right? And um, that was a very different Washington than I was familiar with from 15 years before. Yeah. And I realized this was now common. How has Washington changed? And how have you seen it change for yourself over this period of time? And does it matter that it is now a very, a place of permanence here versus a place of where there's dynamic change in and out? You know, I wish I had a smart answer to that question, but I've yeah. led it. I've led an, I haven't even led a normal Washington life. I mean, <laughs> I mean, first of all, the reason that I'm in Washington as long as I have been, I don't know mm. if I would have stayed, is because my wife is a, a career foreign service officer and her home base is the State Department. And when we're not overseas, we're back in Washington. That's the yeah. way her. You yeah. know, I'm sure if she weren't in that position, we might not be in Washington. And I live out in the suburbs, and I re I go into Washington as infrequently as I can. I mean, quite mm. honestly, I don't like the Washington culture. I I don't like the mm. Washington parties. I don't mm. like all of that stuff. And so I don't even know what's going on in Washington. I'm, I'm sure mm. what you're saying is true, but it's not something that I've really been uh, part of. So how do you look back over this kind of growth that you um, have, you know, you've, the journey that you've traveled, and what are some of the key points along the way that really mattered? I have to dispel any notions that it was all Socrates all the time, um, because uh, I grew up in a very suburban milieu, <laughs> and really it was all football all the time, and yeah. all the Yankees all the time, and that was really yeah. the number one topic of conversation <laughs> at, our, at our dinner table. But um, Look, I obviously, you know, grew up uh, knowing about, you know, the Greeks and mm. my father's view of those things, which I think, and, you know, uh, within that area, and he's a, my father is, he writes only about Athenian democracy, not only, but Athenian democracy is his mm. thing and the nature of that democracy. And the one thing I did learn from that at a very early age, and he's always made this point, is how fragile democracy is. Mm. Um, how rare it is, actually. Um, it doesn't even last in Athens for, uh, you know, forever. And, um, and that, you know, therefore, not to take it for granted and not to just assume, as, um, as some do, that it's the natural evolution mm -hmm. of things. And um, then as far as, you know, my, the experiences that were formative for me, I would say, um, you know, I accidentally wound up sort of working at the State Department. Um, I didn't set out particularly to. It was just one of those things. I had a very sort of tumble, what I call a tumbleweed career, you know, things. Um, uh, I guess what the, uh, the thing I did right after college, I wound up working as an assistant editor at The Public Interest, which was Irving Kristol's mm. magazine, where I met an awful lot of people who would later, you know, be a big role and encouraged me to write about uh. all kinds of things. I mean, uh. I didn't write about foreign policy necessarily um, yeah. in those yeah. days. But that was, that was a formative experience from an intellectual point of view because mm. those were the days when... Uh, the people you look, looked up to, like Irving Kristol mm. uh, and, and others like him, uh, what they were writing, they were writing like very serious essays. That was yes. the big time of the essay form. And you mm. had partisan review and you had the public interest and you had uh, commentary in both of its uh, guises. And that's something that has always meant a lot to me. And a lot of what I do, even some of these books I write, are really just extended essays. And mm. I really think the essay form is important and in this era of 140 characters uh, 
becoming rarer and rarer. Let me also say as we end, uh, Bob, that um, you are one of the gentlemen in our field. Uh, and it is really uh, quite a pleasure to uh, be able to have a real exchange, don't always see eye to eye, uh, and have uh, a real discussion. I always learn something, and I think uh, you have a way of, a graceful way of debating. And thank you for well, coming Well, you're very today. kind. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you.